scarier places were Italy. Really? Italy oh, yeah. was scarier than China nowhere? Yeah. The mafia was there. But I always think there's like a Chinese mafia, but the Italian mafia is more badass. Yeah, well, the Chinese mafia, for whatever reason, wasn't interested in transportation. Yeah, I guess they're badass, but they're just not working in your area. That's, <laughs> they were that's, in our area. that's fair. They but, had, but the Thai mafia was, was in the taxi area. Yeah, the Italian, and it was not, we had a female general manager in Milan. Yes. And they posted her face all over the city saying, kill this woman. CEO and co My friend Emil Michaels, one of the great operators, deal makers, mentors of CEOs in the technology world. He was the chief business officer at Uber, which he built with Travis. Some of the most interesting stories of the most intense operational times in the tech world, dealing with the mafia, coming into countries all around the world, learning how they work to fight cartels to have the good guys win. You know, before he was at Uber, he sold Tell Me to Microsoft. He was involved in the defense world in Afghanistan. A really great immigrant story where his parents came over from Egypt with him when he was young. Emil is a great American, has some really great stories, and one of the most interesting guys we know in the world of tech and operations. Let's hear from him. I'm Joe Lonsdale. Welcome to American Optimist. Emil and Michael. Emil, thanks for joining us today. Great to be here, Joe. You were the chief business officer at Uber. You basically built Uber with Travis and the group, and lately you're doing a lot of investing and other things here in Miami. Tell us about your background. You grew up in, in Egypt, is that right? Your family came over from Egypt? Yeah, I was born in Egypt. Um, my family is Coptic Christian, so it's the 10% minority in Egypt, but the country is now 120 million people, so there's like 12 million Christians there. Mm -hmm. um, and just like a lot of these uh, countries, we have sort of a lopsided religious framework well the, the smaller religion doesn't get as much opportunity as large ones so there was a diaspora in the 70s from mm -hmm. all uh, the christians and and frankly the u.s was incredible in granting green cards so my dad mm -hmm. applied for a green card three times finally got one wow uh, and then i moved here when i was an infant and, and my sister was actually born here and we uh we landed in new rochelle in westchester county of all places in the country wow. to land <laughs> Tell me about immigration policy, because obviously it's a huge deal for you. Yeah. I imagine your family, you yeah. came here, you've been very successful in America. We have a lot of debates what's going on right now. Like, like you know, I think we have 8 million people have come across the border illegally. How, how do you feel about this? I, it's disappointing in so many ways because for two reasons. Number one, a country is not a country without a border, right? And, and not being able to control comes in means, means you can't serve those who come in very well. And if the idea is we have a melting pot, so that everyone who comes in here, we take care of. They're entitled to a public education, to the resources to give them a chance to succeed. Well, you can't do that when it's uncontrolled. Yeah. Um, so that's one piece. The second piece is, um, you know, my family did it the right way. We waited. Um, we couldn't bring our cousins and our families in. We had to sort of go through all the rules that are required. Mm -hmm. And by the way, every one of those that in my family who eventually came in is doing something important and ha loves their work and is contributing back to the society. And we all bought into this melting pot concept. Yeah. We're all American first and then where we came from second. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, that's the way, that's the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. We got a, We got an interesting confrontation at the border. We're going to see what happens there. So you went to you went undergrad Harvard Law School, Stanford. Tell us about your alma mater. What's going on in higher education? Are you one of the people like like signing up to to to, to try to support you know our friends who are trying to fix Harvard? What's what's going on here? Yeah, 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 totally. I mean, what a disaster it has become. It's embarrassing. And there was an incident even before this latest incident uh, with the Harvard presidents in front of Congress, where the Stanford Law School had. Uh, a conservative professor from the, ninth, from the Eighth Circuit or something come to speak. And mm -hmm. he got shouted down, and some protesters told him they wish his daughters were, were, were sexually assaulted. That was sort of on the way in. They <laughs> wish his daughters were assaulted <laughs> yes. because they like, disliked his views so That's much. Right. Um, and, and it was a DEI dean. I remember she got suspended or something and for she this. She got fired least, ultimately for which this. Is, which, which is which at least is a, good, but there's there's like hundreds of other people like that at these schools, right? right. And then and then Stanford Law School is 180 people, so it's a pretty tight community. So it caused a battle um, for them. And then the dean of the law school wrote, you know, hey, we were a First Amendment first kind of place, and then. They're creating a search committee for the new dean, and they put the person who said all these awful things on the committee, the Yikes. search committee. Yeah, so 
I just had the call with them the other day, and I'm like, these these institutions don't really get what's happening in the world around them, and that 48, 49 percent of the country, you know, views the world a certain way, and we're not going to get to a good place if we're shouting down the other side. And that's what that's the opposite of what academia is supposed to be. Right? It, it, it seems I mean, like these places have just really fallen the last five or ten yeah. years. I mean, you I mean, would you still choose Stanford and Harvard for your kids right now with what you're seeing there? Would you like like how would you approach this? It's a great question. I mean, because you're you're weighing the prestige of the place against what you know it is, and what you know it is now is a place where people are walking around with fear to not say what they think. They're not challenging their ideas. That means mm-hmm. they're not coming out as fully formed adults with the ability to critically think through problems and solve them. So it is a question whether I would want someone to go there versus University of Florida where Ben Sass He's done, He's done a there. really good job sort of taking the politics out of school and letting people speak and debate and come out critical thinkers. Ben Sass is a friend. We text and stuff. You know, we're building a new university in Austin. Yes, so hopefully I do. We can create an alternative for your, <laughs> yeah. for your kids there. Yeah, those that's things. That's right. When ATX is ready for them, uh, which gotta, it should be. We got to get the status and the prestige to be above these old places. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the plan. I don't know if a Harvard guy would allow that. That's the- <laughs> <laughs> of course, we would allow that. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have more prestigious stuff than Harvard, fortunately. You've yeah. done. Let's jump to your early career in tech. So you you started at Tell Me. It was an early speech recognition company, and you helped to grow it until it was acquired by Microsoft. It was 2007, Microsoft? Yeah. 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 Tell me about that. Yeah, so we started the company in 99, and we were one of the few lucky companies that raised $100 million, which was a lot of money then. That was a lot. A lot of money in, in August of 2000. And the the, uh, the internet economy started to get wobbly in about March of 2000. Yeah, Peter tells how about they barely got a raise on a PayPal in like it, early September, so right after that. Right basically. after that. And then <laughs> everything crashed. Right. So, so you just in time got like a bunch of money. Right, So which means you you were default alive, yeah. right, to use Sachs' term, and and everything else was down. So now you said, okay, now I have a pile of money. Yep. Does my business model work? It certainly doesn't work with all these people, so we unfortunately do a big layoff. Big, big riff, basically. Big riff. And then had to take the business model we had, which was kind of a consumer thing. Like you called your on your phone, which we didn't have mm-hmm. smartphones at the time, and said, hey, I want a, my Eagle score, and I want the stock price of yeah. Palantir. And, That's um, why it's called Tell Me. You call yeah. and ask about it. It was yeah. like a Yahoo on the phone. And you know, Yahoo used, people used it for information at the time, right? You had your whole, whole day planned in front of you there. Um, that didn't work. So then we pivoted to... Um, it sounds boring, but selling automated phone systems to big companies like American Express, Fidelity, where you'd call up and say, hey, my account number is blank. My address. You so know, you change enterprise. Yes. Yeah. Overnight. And speech recognition technology wasn't that good back then. So what worked? It was good enough to do things with the computer. Do you have, did you secretly have people in India on the other <laughs> side? Like, how did this work? <laughs> like Cruz did? No, no. We had, uh, we had, uh, <laughs> It didn't work well enough, but it worked well enough with what's called directed dialogue. So I know I'm asking you what your account number is. And then I'm now listening for your account number. Got and the it. chances I got it are really high. And actually, the one big win we had was doing directory assistance. So you called, I don't know if you remember, 1 800 555 1212. You wanted the 800 number for Delta Airlines, for American Express. And we killed it. We got like 75% of calls automated relative to operators. So we brought the cost down from $2 to 50 cents. Amazing. And we made a lot of money doing it. So we grinded and grinded, and that company got to about $100 million in revenue, which, which, again, was a lot at the time. Yeah, that's, that's and serious. In yeah, 2007, uh, we sold it to Microsoft. And right before 08, had, we tried to sell good, this thing good in 08. So you basically got really good timing, raising <laughs> yeah. just enough money in time, and then selling it before everything crashed. Yeah. And then, Although sometimes I, I was like, maybe I shouldn't have raised that $100 because I would have went to Google early on or something, but, <laughs> but that didn't work out. <laughs> I read you had like a few hundred million dollar offer on the table and you spent an hour with Steve Ballmer and got that offer way yeah. up to 800. Yeah. How, how did that work? So, so we had an offer from a company called Nuance, which Microsoft also eventually they bought. They eventually bought Nuance, uh, yeah. And it was kind of a crappy small company like we were. And they were offering us 300 million in their private company stock. So mm-hmm. uh, I got Hadi Partovi. I don't know if you know the name, but yeah, he and I, I and Ali and David Wyden were all fraternity brothers at Harvard in the same year. And Alfred Lin and Tony Shea. We all graduated. You Harvard. guys were all the same Harvard yeah. guys. Wow. Uh, because it was 1994. So if you were in tech, 94, and you had ambition to be other than a banker or a uh, consultant, mm. you went into tech, right? The outcasts of us went into tech. <laughs> and uh, 
And I turned this 300 and I said, Hadi, you got to tell Bomber we need, we need to talk to him. And he's like, turns out I'm going jogging with him this morning. That's funny. He got us a 15 minute meeting, flew up to Seattle and Bomber saw my Blackberry on the table. Mm. He dumped his drink on it <laughs> because his, you know, Windows OS was his oh, major that's thing. <laughs> and I was like, great. Now I have no phone, <laughs> no nothing. Front of Steve <laughs> Bomber. He literally just destroys your Blackberry <laughs> yes. if you bring it. That's yeah. hilarious. Um, but we, within two hours, we had a handshake on a deal for $760 million. His corp dev guys were going nuts because he was making deals yeah, on his own. That's funny. He took the computer to do the math on a spreadsheet with, that showed in a screen on the room. And we stayed there the weekend. We walked out with a you know, term sheet the next uh, Monday morning. Wow. And the rest was history. It was the best deal we could Amazing. have possibly done. Yeah. So you've had this, you, you have this big exit. Just assume the first time you're yeah. very wealthy, liquid. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, but you could just move to Miami then, and it'd been good. <laughs> so, what happened? How do you end up at Uber? What's the next step here? Right. So, I'd done nine years. I tell me from the beginning to the end because I'd stay with Microsoft for about a year and a half. So, I was, I was pretty exhausted. Yeah. And you know, selling enterprise software because I ended up being a salesman. I carried a bag. I traveled. I know. The I built quite a few of these things. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. And. Uh, and a lot of shaking hands and kissing babies and steak dinners and all these things. So I did that for so many years. So I said, you know, I want to do something that's more consistent with the passion I had in college, which was doing something for our country, public service, government. I love it. So I, pl I applied to the White House Fellowship Program, mm -hmm. which was a nonpartisan program that took 15 people in mid-career and put them at the top of government and said, we're going to attach you to a cabinet secretary. So I got attached, I got selected, I got attached to Secretary Robert Gates, who was Amazing. Defense Secretary, and he was the first Defense Secretary to be in the Republican and a Democrat administration. Mm -hmm. He was he was an old guard. That's good. So not nonpartisan. I, you know, defense works best when it's nonpartisan. Yes. It's, today too, it's really important. Yes, it is really important. So I got to sit with him as a special assistant, and he was charged with winding down the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I spent, you know, I did six trips to Iraq. Uh, five trips to Afghanistan. And that's why we got out of Iraq and Afghanistan in 2009. <laughs> Thank you, Emil. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I tried my best, but at least I did two things. I was able to deploy some basic mobile phone technology there because what was happening is we were paying the local Afghani troops like $200 uh, a month to keep them to not join the Taliban. Yikes. And the Taliban would then pay them three hundred, and they join anyway. And they join five hundred dollars. It's much a better deal. Well, but yeah. more interesting, the warlords who who were uh, uh, leading these young men were taking the two hundred bucks for themselves. Oh, sure, yeah. So, um, so we then did a mobile payment system so that we could pay them. They got to keep it, um, and we would prevent the warlords from taking it. And then we sort of were able to consistently get them on their side. So they wouldn't be doing IEDs against our, us. So you're basically paying them not to attack us. And some of them maybe still were, though. Like, how do you know? that? I mean, what's the verification system? What's the anti-fraud system here? It seems like they would just scam us. The, the number of IEDs on Airport Road. And I don't remember. So Airport Road. a metric <laughs> just to reduce that. Yeah, reduce just that. reduce that. Whatever we can do. And then we built V-shaped holes, which is trying to get the military to quickly move on a piece of equipment, which is pretty simple. I was already hammering on the defense contractors. Like we, we all we need is the bottom of the car to be a triangle, and so it's harder for it to blow up on this stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, Palantir did a lot of work on the IED stuff in the region, trying to track out the bad guys yeah. who was doing it. I guess, I guess you'd find it's interesting. Like, do you find times you pay people and they would just trick you a lot, or was it pretty, pretty common? Well, once they got the money, they were okay. But so you, we had money to burn. So was it really about money? Because I, 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 it's all these rich people who hate us too, though. So it's like. <laughs> But but Bilov were just desperate and just, and yeah. just needed the money. Just and wanted, was, they, yeah. they didn't care. And they just want to be able to feed their families. Anyone was able able yeah. to help them do that. Taliban weren't. We were, except when the money was getting stolen. So we got it not stolen. And I was on Jayeda, which is the joint uh, IED on you know task force. So we would do crazy things like sprinkle markers into the fertilizer plants in Pakistan that were used to make the IEDs so we could track them. And track where it's and coming shut from. It and shut it down. So I was, because I, because I was the tech guy, I was involved in all these tech so things. So when you sprinkle the markers into these things and you later found them, did you get to go back and like yes. shut down the plant? Like, yeah. Like what would happen to the guys yeah, running the plant? You went to Pakistan and said, this plant is selling um, materiel to terrorists. So they would shut the plant down, the guys would leave the plant and go start another plant instead. Or they do an interrogation of the people working on plants, say who is taking materiel out of the side. Figuring the bad guys were. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I totally believe, obviously, from your success, yeah. you guys are confident people doing this. I don't. I never understood like the big strategy for like for the next ten years, like because yeah. we ended up being there ten years more. Yeah. It's a mess. Like, like what was what was the plan at the time that we we're just going to be here for ten years and keep doing this? Was there a was there like an end goal in mind? Like, like how are people thinking about it? How do we screw this up? This we screwed this up in so many ways. Um, do you remember the surge? <laughs> yeah. Right? So, so President yeah. Obama, I think the military guys like um, uh, who were there at the time didn't want to lose, and what losing to them. A certain loss now versus a, a unclear loss later, with even with all the expenditures, that was okay for the military folks. So this is why we have a, a difference between civilian authority over yeah. military. It's not, their, it's not their money. They're right. fine just to keep going, just not to lose. That's yeah, not to lose. And okay. so we ended up putting more troops in there after 09. But, but without <laughs> any clear goals of where we were going That's with right. the country. I mean, it's, and the country's obviously a mess. It's going to be a mess. It's a tribal thing from 2,000 years ago. They were never going to fix it all. But, but did they have in mind, like, it's not like there's, I remember they started doing like these things where we're trying to build like educational institutions and infrastructure, but it's like they think they were going to somehow bring them into the 21st century. It, is, it doesn't make any sense. You could, there is no way you could take a country that doesn't want to move into the 21st century into the 21st century, no matter how many schools you bought. So if we go and, back to 2009 and you're President Obama or you're the main advisor to him telling him what to do, like, what should we have done at that point? Even if you go back to 2001 after 9 11. Yeah. You have to have more, and this is part of why I like companies that you know the, that Palmer Luckey's building and and so on. Is you have to use the least amount of force to get the most impact. Drones, you de you do decapitations. Maybe you did a lot more bombing in Tora Bora, but sending hundreds of thousands of troops it's not into Kabul for what? To, so, you know, to do what? Yeah, so the bad guys hit us. We got to kill them and deter them. Yeah, but we don't need to be hanging out there with bases. Which no. is, that makes sense to me. Is yeah. Well, why, why should you do that anymore? We got Suleiman. We got where do we get Osama bin Laden? We got yeah. him in some you know country house in Pakistan. Yeah. <laughs> so we spent 15 years trying to get him in a country house in Pakistan. So you know, use intelligence, special forces, smaller weapons, smaller footprint. Make them guess where we're going to do and what we're not going to. Well, do. That was what Palantir was about. That's we right. started it was build the very best intelligence yes, possible. That's right, and then use that to. Yeah. Well, th these days of sending hundreds of thousands of ground troops into a meat grinder. It's nothing country, this country should ever do again. Yeah, well, <laughs> totally agreed. So, I mean, you served our country. You helped make it a little more confident, which I appreciate there. <laughs> yeah. An interesting mess in Afghanistan. <laughs> and then your next big chapter is Uber. So so tell us about that. You, you took a couple of years talking with Travis before you joined, right? Yeah, he came down to visit me while I was in D.C. because he was launching D.C. It was, one of the, it was the third city. Mm -hmm. He said, you got to join me. And I said, you know, a black car service for rich people? I don't know. <laughs> so I'd like to use it maybe. Yeah. You know, Garrett Camp would like to use it, but I'm not well, sure. Because well, black cars used to be... It's like super high status thing, right? It was like a marker that you had money. It's like Mr. Big and Sex in the City. <laughs> yeah, it was right. like, and it's like, and this, but, but we don't think of it that way anymore. But that's how it was at the that's time. That's what it was. Yeah. And it was all Lincoln Town Car. And sometimes they were stretched. I forgot you started with the really nice ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course you guys did. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then the Lincoln Town Cars actually got discontinued by Ford. And we started, and, and they started to say, like, well, why don't we make this an everyman product? Every man mm -hmm. with a Toyota Prius and every rider who wanted to get to the airport didn't want to pay more than a taxi, but one reliability. Why don't we do that? Then I saw it. And I was yeah. like, okay, this product's for everybody. Got it. And then so, I came to him and I said, okay, now it's time for me to join. So you started, basically you were skeptical when it was a high-end yes. thing, but then you realized, but a lot of things are like that. They start yeah. at the high-end and then they come to everyone, right? So as a chief business officer, I mean, you guys had a crazy run. You raised what, like like for the $15 billion in a few years? Yeah. Like how much did you How much did you raise? We raised $15 billion between um, June of fourteen. And June of 16, so in two years. Amazing. So all that fundraising we did, I was there for four years, yeah. was concentrated in two years. I, I remember there were like all these people trying to invest in tech in the U.S. at the time. You guys took full advantage of this. <laughs> it was very impressive. Everyone's like, oh, you, you were only a ZERP you know, phenomenon. I was like, no, we weren't. We would have done it anyway, but you, we were leading you, the charge. But you went that. much faster because yes. of that. You, you had to open like dozens of cities. Did you help create the playbook for this? Like, how, how would you open a new city? How much work was it? Were you running all around? So, so I did the hardest countries. I did China. I did Russia. Wow. Um, I did Saudi. Uh, just the places that had the, a mixture of, you couldn't just drop a money bomb there. You had to, you had a po political thing. You had a PR thing with the U.S. And given our relationship with them. Did people ever get put in jail in these places for anything? Uh, 
there were people. I think in some places, people did a, a, a trip to a trip to jail and trip out, like in Hong Kong, yes. where the look uh, the rules are strict, or in Japan or in France, where mm-hmm. you know certain traffic tickets got you put in jail overnight. I wasn't it wasn't me, thankfully, but um, but yes, mostly it was because we're it was a corrupt taxi system, and we were we were trying to blow it up, and that corruption was everywhere. In the world, I mean, every so, transportation. Yeah, they, they basically, basically, as taxi places had like some kind of version of medallions yes. and cartels everywhere. Cartels are scary though. Cartels find ways to put you in jail yes. when, you, when you fight them. Like, like going to China to fight a cartel would to me be like the stupidest <laughs> thing to do for your career. Like, were you ever nervous like going into these communist countries that you're and you're fighting these guys who are connected? So here's the crazy part: Ch- the Chinese loved us. You know why? It's because we had a competitor, Didi, a local competitor, uh-huh. and. If you're a mayor in China, you're like, the last thing I want is a Chinese tech, you know, rideshare monopoly. So Uber, come in here. What, what, why don't they want the monopoly for themselves? For their um, they were not. So this was in the early part of Xi's term where they were like, no corruption. So you got caught being corrupt. Uh, it was bad. This was such a visible thing. It was useful to actually scare yeah. people to behave. Yeah. So it was useful to scare people to behave there. So then they loved having Uber and Didi there because that meant lower prices for consumers and so on. Um, scarier places were Italy. Really, Italy oh, yeah. was scarier than China. Nowhere, yes, because because the mafia was there. And, but I always think there's like a Chinese mafia, but the Italian mafia is more badass. Yeah, well, the Chinese mafia, for whatever reason, wasn't interested in transportation. Yeah, I guess they're badass, <laughs> but they're just not working in your area. That's, they were that's, in our area. that's fair. They, but, but the Thai mafia was was in the taxi area. Yeah, the Italian, and it was there. We had a female general manager in Milan. Yes, and they posted her face all over the city, saying, "Kill this woman." Um, they snuck into her apartment at night. And hung a, a sign from her apartment to the apartment across the road saying she, you know, she has a relationship, is the nice word of saying, with the taxi commissioner. Um, they really targeted her for, for, for physical harm. Wow. And so Italy today still barely has true ride sharing because really? of that. Yes. The mafia successfully pushed yes. back on this. <laughs> the one country. That's amazing. Yeah. Were there certain playbooks when you, like, like tell, yeah. what, what are the, what, when you open a city, what does that look like? Yeah. So here was the idea. You took, a 30-something former Bain consultant, because they had a little chip on their shoulder relative to McKinsey consultants. <laughs> <laughs> they need the one, step, the one step down. I got no, it. Okay. They, they want they yeah. to win. They're more analytical, so mm-hmm. less theoretical in strategy and more like, okay, I'm going to do this. And we created a launch team, and we said, your job is to go launch Kenya. And yeah, you're, you're American. You, only, you don't speak the local language. You're going to go there, and you can't leave until you do two things. You create liquidity in that market. Liquidity meant you could get a ride in 10 minutes or less anywhere in the city. Wow. That means you have to find out where the drivers are. You have to market to consumers. Mm. You have to do all this stuff to get to, to liquidity. And number two, you had to like a, hire a local to replace you. Mm. And you do those two things, then you can go off and launch oh, the next cool. And you get to do the next one. Yeah. And what was the incentive? You get like more shares for having launched new cities. You get more bonuses. You were higher up on the leaderboard that everyone yeah. in the country saw. <laughs> Everyone's on this leaderboard, yeah. and, and you get higher up. And yeah, you, and this is human competition, and it, it was fun. It was fun competition, but sure, those people got rewarded more stock, more. Were there uh, did a lot of people who like climb that leaderboard end up going on to build great companies? Absolutely, it must be a great talent pool, an amazing talent pool, very aggressive. Now, they're, these are not tech engineer type product types. Yeah, yeah. These are operational, yeah. you know, business unit owner types. Um, and they've spread all over the valley in great positions. You know, I've, I've encountered a few of them yeah. over there before. So they're really good people to hire from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. I'm very bullish now on operations <laughs> alongside tech because yeah. of everything going on. Yeah. You know, I, I remember going to walk with you after you joined Uber, and it, it just it sounded like just a really, really intense thing that you were in the middle of. Like, was, was there something about your personality that helped you kind of <laughs> confront and deal with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a night owl, so. Um, and maybe it was because during the day I was with Travis all day, and he was intense, and we yeah, sort of yeah. fed off each other and that. But, but when you're when you're a company of three hundred people, say, and you're operating already in twenty four time zones, that means the missiles are flying at you yeah. all the time. Regulatory, there was an accident. Uh, you I know. assume you'd wake up and you check, and there'd be yeah, a bunch of new things going on. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and that's when you get to sleep at midnight because. You know, China was 15 hours ahead from West Coast time, right? So yeah. you finish your Chinese calls on at midnight. And it was just a barrage of opportunity and a barrage of problems. And then and then every day of getting up and saying, how do we finance this incredible juggernaut? And then how do we finance Uber Eats? And then how do we finance what would have been Instacart had Travis Knight continued there? Yep. So we were just ambitious. Yep. 
And I, I feel like this was one of the first companies, it was right around the time when the press really started to turn on tech. So they really, and they really, they really turned on Uber. Like, how did, how, why did that happen? I think, I, I, is it just a broader societal thing and you guys were the obvious target? Or was there something else that you think you could have done differently? Uh, so a couple things. So compare Brian Chesky and Travis personality-wise. <laughs> <laughs> Start at the fair. same time. And, and you know, some of it has to do with just, the, you know, how the leader approaches it. And now I would argue that Brian Chesky could not have built Uber with with the personality and, and you had to be a little more aggressive. Yeah, yeah you had you had to be because yeah. of pe pe your people are going to jail. Yeah, the taxi <laughs> medallions are much more the taxi cartel is much more intense yes. than he was dealing with it. The hotels are not quite that mean basically. It's not a cartel, it's a bunch of corporations yeah, and more labor kind of, unions. Yeah. You know, um yeah, so a different fight. And then number two, um 2017 uh, 16 election happened. And we we're on the West Coast and the anger from the population that was like, couldn't believe that the president was elected. January 20th, um, uh, Trump put the Muslim ban into effect. Yep. And a few days later, we had the first delete Uber campaign, which was the first yeah. true blow up. And it was because we decided to reduce surge for the protesters at JFK airport. And we said, hey, you, you wanna protest? We'll, we'll take you home, we won't raise the prices on you. The taxi guys said that we were undercutting their own protest on the same thing, and it oh, turned wow. into a, a, a nationwide delete Uber campaign. We lost half a million customers. Hold on, but you were trying to help the yes. protesters, so that was a mistake. I mean, like, yes, you shouldn't, so shouldn't have done matter. that. It doesn't matter. You shouldn't help know, these la, people. La, 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 right? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but you got to get punished for trying to help, yes. the, help these guys. That's yes. hilarious. And so half a million customers Uber, that was like, you know, $500 million of market cap. We just lost that one day Wow! because of that. And it was very easy to protest. I, I'm against whoever made this policy, delete this off my phone, yeah. screenshot it, Instagram. It's one of the first times this happened. Yeah. But ultimately it didn't hurt Uber that much or did it? No, it did. There was the beginning. And then, you know, we took you know, the thing about our set, taking investments from the Saudis, Susan Fowler, workplace culture. They just kept finding it. it. Just, yes. The workplace culture obviously had to be intense. It was intense. I mean, are there other cultures today you see that are as intense as Uber was back then? Is that is that a thing you've seen around otherwise? Yeah, I mean, look at like oh Coinbase God. and like uh, Brian Armstrong's statement about what is culture. Uh, well, well, I really like that. Well, he's just trying to take out some of the politics. Yeah, that. which was which. That's what you guys did too. Yeah, that's what we did too. It was very similar, and it was uh, a very transparent, radical candor place. And ninety nine percent of the people who went through Uber say it was the best experience of their life. What you read about from is the one percent is angry, and, yeah. and so is that one percent? And I think people are really longing for that culture again in business. Like you're 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 mission oriented, you're intense, you're trying to win. I can't imagine Palantir was that much different. It was we, <laughs> we were skipping weekends the first few yeah. years for sure. I was right. like, I totally disagree with Dustin Moskovitz thing where he's like, oh, you can work forty hours, we can be just as successful. I'm like, I know they were working ninety hours on Facebook for the first several years. I'm like, come on, come on. Come on. I don't. On. I, yeah, I think it's. I mean, I'm sure there are types of work-life balance that are healthy in some contexts, but when you're creating like a hyper-growth startup, it's like trying to win a gold medal in the Olympics. You're, you're going for it, right? Yeah. And, if, and if you go home and the rest of the team is there and you're like, hey, we succeeded, you're like, well, you, you, yeah. you, know, you, you didn't. The leader, you, the leader has to set the tone. Yes. The leader's not crazy intense. Like however intense the leader is, everyone's going to be a little bit less intense. Yes. Is this true today in my firm as well? Like they have to see you do it all the time or they're not going to. They're not going to. That's right. Yeah, People that, follow leaders. But it's like some of these things when they're working, it's like one of the, for me, it's like one of the most interesting and fun things to be is in that kind of intensity, yes. right? It's like, so you kind of kind of look for that. Yeah. Do you think you'll ever have that again in your life? Like something like that? Yeah, I look for it. I dream about it every day. Um, <laughs> you know, I was, you know, when I when I have been to OpenAI, I feel some of that intensity. When I, I went to this company, uh, Zipline the other day, mm -hmm. I felt an intensity. Is that the, is that the delivery thing? The, the drone yeah. delivery yeah. thing that's delivering medicines and vaccines. That's and, super cool. Yeah, yeah, very cool. They're, the intensity when you walk in the office, and you're this is San Francisco at a Friday at five, and then everyone's I, 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 there. I love they still have that going there. <laughs> yeah, no, we still have that in some of our top defense companies. Maybe some of our top new AI things yeah. too. There's, it, 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 there's, it's exciting. Right it now. is exciting. It's because people feel like they're on the frontier and they can help push it in. Exactly, you're, cha you're changing the world, and you're part. You're part of you're this part positive of force. Yeah, you, you, you know, zooming out on the gig economy is something term everyone used yeah. to use. We don't talk about as much anymore now. There's AI yeah. and stuff, but like, did the gig, gig economy live up to its promise? Did it achieve what it was supposed to? Like, like, was it was it positively impactful overall? I mean, I can't even see an argument in any way where it wasn't. And again, this is the political sort of view versus the actual reality view. 
Uber over time has probably paid a hundred billion dollars to drivers. A hundred wow. billion dollars. The entire taxi system probably only ever paid, you know, a hundred million dollars after fifty years of existence. Yeah. So, yeah. so many people got access to money in a flexible way than the decades before them, and just the last decade. Um, and so, yes, are you saying that limo drivers now make less today than they would have at Uber? Sure, there are some casualties yeah. there, but you now can guarantee a ride to the airport. And do you remember yeah. trying to get a taxi in San Francisco, Joe, when we yeah, lived it was, there? It was to horrible. the airport. You know, horrible. what would you do? Uh, well, they didn't show up. Yeah. Um, you basically employed a full-time driver if you could afford it. If you could afford that it. Was a, that was a thing to do. You know, or else you had a friend drive you. And yep. you know, your friend were like two people's time wasted. Right? Yep. So, so it, it was all for the better. It gave people enormous serving opportunities. And guess what? If you don't like it, you don't have to do it yeah, the yeah, next yeah. day. You know, I didn't make enough. I didn't like it. Of course. And so that's what people forget. It's not like they're being forced to drive for Uber. Like they're looking at the numbers. A lot of people still argue, well, Joe, they're not making enough to cover their costs. Well, I'm like, people are not as stupid as you think, right? They they would just stop doing it. They have a car payment, an insurance yeah. payment, and gas. And the, yeah. Are they not making enough to cover that? And then some? Yeah. Why would they do it? Obviously. And people, I think people understand markets yeah, very well. So it's it's really very good. annoying. It's our friend. I love Joe Green, but he's like always like, <laughs> she's like back then he's like, it's not paying them enough. It's wrong. I'm like, dude, it's like, it's, I think it's like this, it's unfortunately on the left, it's an arrogance where they assume people just don't know yeah. what they're doing. You know, I, I saw a great story about this also. Apparently there's the guys who come here from other countries, just work an Uber really, really hard for like a couple of years. And then they buy like apartment complexes back <laughs> in these other countries. So I thought it was kind of a neat thing. Like yeah. Just get their whole family set up back home and then go back and do it. Yeah. And it's, uh, I had the same argument with Joe. And then I'm like, Joe, then why do you keep taking Ubers? <laughs> you know, it's just why <laughs> I got to get around. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So do you talk to drivers? Are they happy? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or is it, yeah. You know, give me a break. It's funny. Yeah, maybe we just shouldn't interfere with people in a market. Yeah, maybe like, we just let them do their thing. Yeah. I want to pivot a little bit to leadership lessons. Yeah. Uh, you're, you know, you're a master negotiator and communicator. Do you have a framework for how you approach some of these high stakes conversations? Can you teach us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, and I, I, I like to call myself more, a little bit more of a deal maker than a negotiator because, because I like to, th I, I like to think that I make deals happen that wouldn't otherwise happen because I'm able to pierce sort of the the human emotion that sometimes gets in the way of deals and pierces sort of different math that people are doing their own math they're not doing the other person's math to see where you can intersect mm -hmm. um and find a place of agreement and i guess the thing i the first thing i learned er, er, early on is to to walk the line between humility and confidence you don't want someone who's too arrogant but you don't want someone who's a pushover yeah. either you it's want a tough line it's a it? tough line but if you can walk that line where you can walk into a room and be you know, humble if you're working with a CEO and you're a director at some startup. But guys like you and me have to pretend to be a little more humble than we are. <laughs> I, I know how it works. Know. <laughs> but 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 if you can flex between those two, that CEO and I, I walked in the CEO of AT and T or American Express when we were doing it or early days at Uber. No one really knew Uber, and they respect the fact that I was confident. But also, I was humble and say, "Hey, I really, you know, here's what you would bring to my company, and I'll really value that." Right. Um, so that was one lesson, and that goes up and down the aid scale. The second is be over-prepared. Work, I work my ass off before yeah. any negotiation, before any uh, Just know all the details on both sides. Everything. Of everything. Yeah. Where you went to college, you know, what your favorite team was. You know, again, if it was available, who you're married to, when you got married to. Interesting. Where were you in your career journey? Were you trying to get promoted? Or were you already at the top? Um, what are the things that matter to you? Because that, that comes through in your negotiation style. Yeah. Right? So then I knew... If you were like, I got to get to Tahoe in like 30 minutes, buddy, so you better wrap this up. I tried That's to like jam in my points in the last 30 minutes. I really yeah. did try to understand the person holistically. Um, and then third, always be on top of creating um, the next deadlines, compelling event. Look backwards for when the deal needs to get closed. Have people emotionally commit to the steps they're in. And usually piss, people miss deadlines all the time. But they feel bad when yeah. they promise you, I'll get back to you Tuesday. They don't get yeah. back to you Tuesday, remind them. Remind them. Remind them. Yeah, remind get, and we, like, we, how about Thursday? And they're like, okay, fine, Thursday. We call this process engineering. It's yeah. super important. Yes. I think it's really bad when people don't actually sit, pace the process yes. ahead of time, how it's going to work. Yeah. yeah. And then ideally, in a negotiation for f financing, you want to bring the process of many different parties up at the same time so you have choices. And you could ride, then you could drive the valuation and stuff. So the process in that case was creating an auction environment. Right, it's not always an auction environment, but in fundraising, it tends to be. No, totally. Yeah. And so you mentor and advise a lot of CEOs. Yeah. What are some What are some mistakes you see young entrepreneurs making? 
So in this last cycle that, that you and I have been through, this is our third probably, right? Um, the 2021 valuation peaks were so high. I know. Yeah. that getting entrepreneurs to understand that that peak is gone, just assume it's gone forever. Yeah. And now start from first principles. What are you trying to build? Do you actually have product market fit? How much money do you have in bank? How are you burning? Do you need to be burning that much? That took like six to 12 months to get people to understand that those times aren't coming back. Oh, yeah. Just not coming back. And yeah, it's very difficult because everyone wants to give you money and it's a whole different world now. It's just a whole different world. That's good. It's, uh, people... We used to call it FOMO. I said, we're JOMO. People are, there's joy in missing out now. People are like, oh, that seemed too expensive. Thank God I didn't oh, touch yeah. that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right? No, I mean, I wish you could go back a couple of years knowing what we know now. Yeah. 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 Um, I did raise a lot of money for some of my companies, though, which was great. We had, we had I think, uh, 50 rounds in 2021 in my wow. portfolio that were greater than 75 million uh, you know, in size. So it's like, that's, there's just a lot of money flying around. There's a here. lot of money sitting yeah. in balance sheets right now. So. Yeah. But the point is, even if you did get that money, you still have to operate differently in this environment because you're not going to get that money again. You have to. You have to. It's really hard if you have too much money. You have, to, you have to really know that it's like you have to pretend someone's not there, basically, because yes. it's bad. Bad for discipline. It's bad for discipline, and it's yeah. bad for, um, you know, you're bad for liquidity, and you know, you're going to be spending money on on weird projects and so on. So the hardest thing to get entrepreneurs is to accept that and. Maybe I didn't accept that the first bubble we went through and got burst. Yeah. But I'm tell, I, I literally tell entrepreneurs, I know you're not going to listen to me, but you <laughs> really are gonna, not going to be able to raise more money. You have to do a riff now, and you have to start slimming the company down. Six, 12 months later, they get it. But then they do one, two, three more riffs, and they still you – know, the, yeah. the speed at which people they, react. They need, to, they need to cut right away. Yeah, it's yeah. hard. And, and you have to sit in a room and say, what do we have product market fit, or was it just because we had a money bomb dropped on us? And if we don't, how do we get it, right? And if we do, how do we make sure we're exploiting it, you know, in the maximum way possible? Hundred percent. Let's talk about talent. You 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 said you want to prioritize the talent even over a great product early on. Like, what? Why is that? You know, when I when I imagine myself sitting around Uber or Telmany, I looked around that talent. I was like, man, this business model can change, but these people are going to find whatever the best business model is, given the idea we started with. Mm. And they are so passionate that they're going to drive it through. And that was true at both companies. We didn't know we were going to do Uber Eats at Uber. Mm. We didn't know we were going to go into China and Russia and all these places. Today, the company's worth $130 billion. At the time, it was $300 million. Wow. And... The, those people around the table, many of them are still there, actually. Well, what, would it, what would it have been worth if, if it wasn't screwed up? $600 million, probably $600 5X. Yeah, $600 billion. $600 billion? Yeah, wow. 5X. We would have been Instacart. We would have had a payment system because we'd have so much share of wallet. Yep. Um, there was so much more we would have done. Yeah, I feel like this platform, there's like so many act two and threes on top oh, of this yeah. thing for, for an entrepreneurial team. Absolutely. We're the, or we called it the urban logistics fabric. We would have been able to get anything and anybody from one place, one part of the city to the next. And that's a lot of money you'd be transporting uh, <laughs> in the, if you that's actually right. did that well. It's very impressive. It's funny, this, the mindset like 20, 15 years ago was that like five or 10 billion is a really big win. Yeah. And it's kind of funny how it shifted because now it's like, it's not a really big win if you don't get to over a hundred billion, which is obnoxious, but that, but that is like the mindset yeah. in the Valley amongst, I mean, obviously we're spending time with Peter and Elon and all these guys. So it's a different, different bar, but yeah. it's, but it, but it is kind of interesting how Uber could have been like one of the giant tech yeah. companies. And it is still a very big win though, yeah. obviously. But, but, but look at Lyft. What's the difference between Lyft and Uber? We started at the same time. Lyft is worth $6 billion today. That's a 20 X difference. The, the single difference was leadership and ambition. Right, the only thing you can attribute it to, because they started, frankly, they started ride sharing the UberX equipment before we did. Wow. It's because we were more ambitious, we hired better people, you, uh, and we moved faster. And you push yourself harder. You guys right. were probably the operations were just more intense from everything I saw. Yeah, yeah, that matters. Yeah, no, it does. <laughs> it turns out. So, Emil, we started the American Optimist to push back on a lot of the cynicism and division we're seeing in America today. Like, what's your what's your best argument to be an optimist on the future of America? My best argument is. If you surveyed every other um, person in the world who is living in America now, what's the one country they would want to live in? What system that they think is the best for their children? They would still choose this system. They wouldn't choose China, Russia, you know, Brazil, Indonesia, the other top, you know, Pakistan, the other five populous countries. They would choose America still. Mm -hmm. um, and they're still, whether the southern border thing has some of that element too. Why are they coming here? It's because of the best opportunity. So when people criticize our system, they say it's broken, irredeemable. They're just wrong. 
Because <laughs> if they were right, why would all these people want to be coming here? And so it's still the best place in the world for anyone to get a fair shot at success for them and their children. So I'm optimistic that so, so long as our system continues to attract that people, we must be doing something right. This must be an okay place to live and to raise children and so on. So um, I think the naysayers are wrong when they say America's best days are behind and, us. And, and what, what, you know, what, what innovation or technologies you're seeing right now are exciting you the most about the future in terms of, in terms of a positive version of the future? You know, I look at the regulations that uh, that the U EU is trying to put on AI and everything, <laughs> and then, and you know, India bans uh, banned a bunch of tech too, and in South America they can't even develop the tech, and so you're like, where else is the next wave of AI, which is going to produce mass efficiency, mass knowledge uh, dissemination? Um, nowhere but here. You know, we're going to have the first of everything in this new platform that's building. If you thought about the last platform as the iPhone and apps mobility, this next platform of, of AI is going to be innovated on here faster uh, with more money and more direction than anywhere else in the world. And, um, you know, I, I do worry about the Chinese brute forcing it and using it only for CCP purposes. Mm -hmm. And we have to be careful not to regulate ours so that we become secondary to the Chinese, but that's the only the risk I see out there. But the benefit that I see is gonna accrue to our country more than anywhere else. Yeah, well, I totally agree. That's a great note to end it on, Emil. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Thanks for having me. That's great.